Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Pulat Yunusov of uh, Yunusov Pro Law Professional Corporation. I'm a litigation lawyer in Toronto, a commercial litigator. And we publish a series of uh, video interviews with uh, all kinds of professionals uh, to share with the public, with our clients, with anyone who might be interested in these topics. None of these interviews, of course, are legal advice. They are to highlight a wide range of professionals that we have in Toronto and hopefully outside of Toronto and uh, to uh, stimulate discussion of these topics. Uh, today, we are meeting with an experienced tax lawyer, Anna Maljavaya. She wants to share some updates about latest CRA audit trends with us. This is a fascinating topic for anyone who uh, files and pays taxes in this country. So without further ado, I uh, pass the floor to Anna. Anna, hello, uh, please talk about yourself first, talk about your practice before we uh, continue on to questions. Hi, Pulat, thank you for having me again. It's a pleasure always. Your interviews are a lot of fun. Um, my name is Anna Malajavaya. I am a tax lawyer and I am the founder of a tax law firm called Advo Tax Law in um, Etobicoke, west part of Toronto. And we help people with any kind of tax problems, tax litigation problems, when they're, when they're being audited or reassessed or where, when they're appealing the results of uh, the CRA's decision at the tax court. We're also helping people who are trying to organize their affairs in the most tax efficient manner. So we help people who are looking, help with ta looking for help with tax planning. So anything tax. Fantastic. We are now undergoing a global pandemic. Everybody knows about it. In one court hearing, a judge uh, told the lawyer, look out of the window in response to a question of, about why the judge was doing something, right? And uh, we also know that many things have changed because of the uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 emergency that we have here in Ontario and in Canada and in, in the world. How have CRA audits been impacted by COVID-19? Like everything else in this country, they were on hold for some time, starting March 13th, I think, or March 16th. So like everyone else in this country, the CRA, CRA employees were sent home um, to the extent that their service is not absolutely essential. Uh, and they continued working from home, but as you can imagine, for some people it was possible, for some people it was not realistic because they had small children or they didn't have equipment. So if you're being audited, if you're currently being audited, chances are you did not hear from your auditor in a while. And this is because there was um, a, a formal uh, direction sent to CRA employees with the instructions not to ta contact taxpayers. And for a while, uh, we did not have any contact with, with CRA uh, auditors or appeals officers. Everyone was at home waiting to see what happens. Uh, starting from June 26, June 26, we heard that the CRA began a transition to full business, full service mode. It doesn't mean that immediately uh, we're going to hear back from CRA auditors and appeals officers. Uh, there may still be a bit of a delay in everything that's going on, but if you were audited before COVID and you did not hear from your auditor, that does not mean that your audit disappeared or somehow resolved and it's not a problem anymore. No, it's still there, it's a problem and chances are you're gonna hear from someone maybe this summer, maybe this fall. 
I hear that the latest instruction CRA auditors received is that they have to resume their normal working operation, normal workload, and apparently it's gonna, we're going to see some serious activities soon. I see. Well, now that we have COVID-19 uh, update out of the way, uh, which was really interesting, I think it's, it's great to know. I really want to get to the basics of CRA audits for our audience. What is a CRA audit? Maybe from the legislative perspective, maybe from uh, uh, the perspective of someone who is experienced with CRA audits, what is it in general? It's a way to ensure, protect the integrity of our tax system. In Canada, we have something called self-assessment system. Every April or every June, depending on your business organization or, or structure, we prepare tax returns or we prepare tax returns for our corporations and we file those tax returns. We include information in those tax returns and the CRA relies on that information in assessing and our tax liability. So it's called self-assessing. I, Anna, decide that I made X amount of dollars this year. I put that number on my tax return. I file it, the CRA assesses it at First, at face value, uh, determines my, uh, I determine my tax liability, I pay the tax, and then if we did not have audits, I may not necessarily be always be truthful in declaring that number. That number may be much higher, but I may only declare X amount of dollars. So that's why we have audits to protect the integrity of our tax system, to make sure we have schools and roads and hospitals and everything else in Canada. So is it fair to say that our tax system or our tax information or reporting system is, is an honor system with selective distrust? Exactly right, that's a good way to put it. Well, if, if this distrust is selective, then how do uh, taxpayers get selected for an audit? Um, in alphabetical order, no, I'm, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> it depends. Lately, what we see, we see um, uh, the CRA investing a lot of money into what's called risk assessment software. This is a sophisticated software that analyzes data to, um, to pick out of millions of uh, tax returns filed every year, to pick the ones that may not necessarily you know, be correct. And, uh, and sometimes that risk is determined based on the correlation between your uh, reported income and your reported expenses. Uh, sometimes you may get flagged because of the losses you declared. There are a number of different uh, risk assessment programs that are uh, very sophisticated developed by the CRA. And mm, a lot of audits these days we see originated from uh, these uh, softwares. On top of it, obviously, we have what's called projects, so audit projects. The most famous probably now is the real estate projects in large cities um, in Canada, Toronto, Vancouver, maybe some activity in Montreal. So there is a task force, real estate task force within the CRA um, formed specifically with a, 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 a goal to identify non-compliance in the real estate sector. So if you are in real estate, chances are the CRA scrutinizes you more than someone who is working in, let's say, manufacturing. Um, in, in, uh, in, I'm talking about large cities too. Um, another project that's very um, famous is an offshore compliance project. 
um, where the CRA tries to identify people who may not uh, declare all uh, offshore earnings um, in the uh, Canadian tax returns. Um, and my apologies. And uh, also, uh, the question was how how people get picked for an audit. Sometimes it's a tip. Sometimes it's your former spouse. Sometimes it's your former business partner uh, who uses an anonymous tip line that's available on the CRA's website to call and to report um, you whether truthfully or not. Sometimes it's the legal trouble that you got yourself in and um, somehow the uh, information of that legal trouble is um, transferred to the CRA. So different sources. I was really, I was really fascinated when you mentioned the uh, software that scans uh, uh, or parses millions of tax returns. That sounds like machine learning to me or something like AI. Am I uh, generally in the, in, the right, in the right place there? Do you think uh, it's something like that? It, it's in that area. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in AI, but um, these, uh, all I know is, is that uh, some very smart people are working on, uh, on those programs and they're becoming more and more sophisticated every year because uh, they receive a lot of funding from the government. Right. So an interesting in inference is that CRA will probably get better at finding subjects for audits because uh, with what we know about technology, it, it only gets better at sure. doing what it does. Do you think it's a fair statement about CRA? Absolutely. And as we move towards cashless society, um, mm -hmm. look at the impact of COVID. Some, a lot of businesses just don't accept cash. And as we right. move towards cashless society and there's more data to analyze, it will become even better, even more sophisticated, for sure. What is the legislative authority for CRA? I assume it comes from the legislation for these audits and for uh, parsing all of these returns. It's the Income Tax Act, uh, and there are a number of provisions uh, that, first of all, impose the obligation to file a return. That's Section 150 of the Income Tax Act, and there is a number, uh, there's a whole section in the Act that's devoted to the CRA's powers as they conduct those, audit, those audits, and the powers are quite wide. Interesting. Since we are pretty much on uh, uh, audit fundamentals here, uh, I have a couple of questions. The, the legislation provides for CRA's authority to conduct audits. I wonder if it also provides for uh, corresponding duties on the part of taxpayers and, uh, and whether um, certain charter rights apply to CRA investigations or audits? For example, right to counsel. What do you think about that? Uh, no, uh, right to counsel would not be extended to, well, you, you, you have a right to retain counsel, absolutely. Um, most people at, at the initial stage of, of, of the audit choose not to. Um, Charter arguments are not accepted in the tax court of Canada. So it's not something you can argue within the tax court. It's outside of the jurisdiction of the tax court. Where we see um, tax, uh, where we see charter arguments in our tax practice most commonly used is the, uh, that uh, the uh, transition that that line where a civil audit, uh, a civil audit, is no longer a civil audit and it becomes a criminal investigation. And as soon as it becomes a criminal investigation, the taxpayer 
has all the rights that every accused must have. So this is where we have charter arguments um, used commonly. I'm curious, does CRA here perform uh, the function of the police or does CRA pass this file to RCMP, for example, when uh, a criminal investigation is uh, on the horizon? Uh, there is a special criminal investigation division within the CRA and they do work with RCMP um, together in implementing the investigation and, uh, and then uh, placing charges. And uh, uh, the criminal offense uh, is defined in the criminal code or in the Income Tax Act? Income Tax Act, Section 238 to 239. Does this section uh, in the Income Tax Act that defines the criminal offense uh, also include information about uh, penalties? Yes, uh, you you uh, you can be liable for a penalty um, anywhere from fifty to two hundred percent of the tax you try to evade, uh, and that's on top of the civil penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a jail term um, uh, that you can go to jail, uh, up to two years per charge, I believe, for some offenses, and the most serious offenses can carry a five-year uh, jail term. And what is this criminal offense called in the Income Tax Act? Uh, tax evasion, uh, different uh, varieties of it, and that's making okay. full statements on tax return, um, and. Um, a number of uh, inciting other people to uh, make false statements, uh, inciting other people to uh, evade tax, a number of different offenses. Do you think that these provisions will be used to pursue suspected uh, abusers of, uh, of COVID-19 relief benefits? Good question. Uh, obviously, I can't tell you from experience because the rules are so new, but what we're I seeing now, we're seeing um, a lot more activity in criminal investigation area. And this is something new for the CRA, and we think it's you know, it's a speculation, but we think it's connected to all the government spending that has that had happened recently, and now the uh, the need to somehow compensate that spending through a collection of taxes, um, and some of it will be done through civil audits, and some of it will be done through uh, criminal um, criminal investigations and uh, criminal charges. Um, and that's why we see in the last, you know, I think I would say it, it happened even before COVID, we see a lot more criminal investigation activity on the CRA side than we had seen before. Uh, and uh, if before criminal charges were reserved for the most evil, non-compliant, obviously, obviously very evil people, to, but now we see uh, criminal charges used in seemingly um, regular audits um, with modest amounts involved, um, yet we see uh, referrals to criminal investigation. Interesting, so you expect the CRA crackdown this year? As soon as they are able to start working uh, full force, despite the working from home limitations, I would expect a lot of activity, yes. I see. And of course, all of this applies both to individual taxpayers and to corporate taxpayers, correct? Absolutely. Inclu including criminal consequences. Absolutely, yes. And if I'm not a criminal lawyer, I'm a commercial litigator, but I remember 
if I'm if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, corporations can also be charged criminally, including under the Income Tax Act. I'm not a criminal lawyer. You're not a criminal lawyer either, right? Right. <laughs> we need to get a criminal lawyer on the show, <laughs> which I will. Very interesting. Uh, do you think there is a uh, uh, an area of specialization uh, within criminal law where criminal lawyers specialize in uh, criminal charges relate, uh, abroad under the Income Tax Act? Or is it uh, uh, really within the purview of tax lawyers? Um, it depends. My in my practice, we currently don't uh, do criminal tax evasion. We refer the files to criminal lawyers. Uh, and from my research, uh, there weren't many lawyers who make it their specialty or their only uh, area because there wasn't enough work before. But times are changing and it may become a very, a very interesting area and, and uh, with a lot of work. Mm -hmm. uh, and without even going as far as predicting criminal liability, I think it's very, fairly safe to say that people can expect audits of, of their business um, applications for relief uh, related to COVID-19, such as um, such as uh, payroll relief. I, I know there are a bunch of acronyms there. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a bunch of acronyms there. I'm just not in command of this acronym. So the wage subsidy. The wage subsidy the, will definitely the, be reduced. Yeah, it will be reviewed probably the the business loans, right? What is what is that called? I uh, see by Canadian Emergency Business right. Account. Right. Even though even though it's administered by commercial banks, is it still going to potentially maybe subject to CRA audits? That's a very good question because uh, really the legislative basis for SIBA loans and for SICRA, that's, this is commercial, uh, Canadian Emergency Commercial Rent Assistance. Uh, the basis for this program is the um, ability uh, given to the government, in, in the case of SIBA, to guarantee loans provided to um, taxpayers. Uh, this is in Bill C-14 uh, that was provided, that was enacted in, um, at the start of the pandemic, I think it was April of 2020. And based on that sole provision that allows the government the power to guarantee loans to taxpayers, the SIBA program was designed and implemented. Uh, but it, it, the agreement, the only, uh, the only basis for the loan is your agreement with the bank. It's not a, a law, it's not a section in the Income Tax Act, it's not a section or any, in, a, in any other legislation that allows and regulates the terms of that loan. It's your agreement with the bank and your, the, whatever um, uh, attestation that you sign, the representation that you made to the bank. Um, it's it's unclear still as to the penalties that may follow in the case if, if in case someone uh, misrepresents uh, the information in uh, your SIBA application. It's unclear what exactly that person may expect. For sure, it's a breach of contract, but when it comes to uh, consequences from the CRA, we as tax lawyers are not really certain as to what else that would entail. Uh, this is to compare, this is on, sorry, for the wage subsidy, however, the, the uh, situation is different because we have uh, uh, amendments to the Income Tax Act that provide for the wage subsidy and if you made false uh, um, statements uh, in your wage subsidy application, that will be governed by the penalties already included in, in the Income Tax Act. So wage subsidy is in the Tax Act, the penalties 
and criminal uh, charges will apply if uh, things go wrong. But SIBA and the, um, my apologies, but SIBA and uh, the, um, But SIBA and the commercial rent program, uh, we still don't know how penalties are gonna work there. I'm sure there'll be consequences for misrepresentation uh, in, for those programs, but we just don't know exactly what there will be. My thought on SIBA is uh, besides civil liability to the bank, which administers the loan for misrepresentation, let's take that example, since the government here is clearly conferring a benefit on a taxpayer in the form of a loan guarantee. Um, I'm wondering if the government then is, uh, acquires a host of rights and the powers uh, similar to um, those it has in other situations when it pays a benefit, right? So when the government makes welfare payments, for example, or or uh, CRB payments. Uh, the, obviously, the government has a, a, a bunch of powers and rights with respect to audits, investigations, and pr um, prosecutions. So I, I would say a loan guarantee is a benefit conferred, conferred by the government, just like a cash payment, right? So my, this is my guess. I don't know if it makes sense or not. Oh, it makes total sense when there may be other ways to, uh, I'm, 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 what we are sure is that there will be consequences for misrepresentation on those um, applications. What we are not certain is to exactly what those consequences will be. I see, I understand. Uh, Anna, any other uh, SARI audit trends that you want to talk to our listeners about? Uh, yes, uh, something interesting we've seen recently. It's not new, but this is a new trend. Uh, unnamed uh, person requirements. This is when you get a letter from the CRA, you're a third party, you have nothing to do, you're a good, honest taxpayer or good, honest business. You get a letter from the CRA where they ask you to provide all your clients names of, and contact information, bank or account information for all your clients. Um, imagine how happy your clients would be if they know you have to do it. Imagine how uncomfortable you would be to do it. So naturally, um, we, we we see a lot of resistance from businesses. They don't want to release the, the names of their clients to the CRA. Um, and uh, the really the only test that uh, that's, that's applicable in this situation is that the group of that, that person, the CRA doesn't know who, they, 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 it's not like they know that Mr. X evaded tax and had dealings with your business. They only know that you may have dealt with someone who did not pay tax, and that's enough for them to request a list of your entire clients. It doesn't matter if some of those clients clearly have done nothing wrong. It doesn't matter if that list is very large, voluminous, and it's gonna take you a lot of time to produce it. All that it matters is that there's a way to somehow identify that group um, and uh, in that requirement. And in that case, you would have to release that list of your client, the list of your clients to the CRA. It's, it sounds to me like CRA is building a Facebook of taxpayers. <laughs> uh, by Facebook, you mean a, a, well, they have that Facebook already. They just want to complement it with more pictures and, and posts. I, I, guess, I guess they want to identify connections. Who is, uh, you know, if we use the Facebook analogy, they want to know who your friends are. They don't want to simply have a, a list of all taxpayers in the country. They also want to know who is transacting with whom. So they're building a 
a data network, which from my background in uh, computer science uh, would, uh, would help in, in, the, in their machine learning effort, efforts or in their efforts to spot uh, candidates for audits? Um, usually it's less, well, at this time it's, it's, there is a more obvious answer to, to the question as to why they're doing it. They're doing it because it's a handy tool for them to pick people for the audit. I, and where we see these requirements is again, construction and real estate, uh, real estate mm -hmm. sector. You must have heard the um, story of uh, Home Depot where they had to release um, information on all their business accounts with the transactions, with transactions over $50,000. Um, they had to do it, they, they took it to court, they lost, they still had to, they had to release th uh, the names of their clients. This is thousands. Ho of Home names. Depot had to? Home Depot had to, so if you have a credit card with Home Depot, and if you transacted uh, over a year of, um, if you made purchases for over $50,000, your name and all your information will be revealed to the CRA. And then the CRA will compare your reported income with uh, that with the volume of activity on your Home Depot credit card. And if the risk assessment software determines that the two numbers don't match up, uh, for example, some people in construction industry like to declare $14,000 of income regularly, but live in $2 million houses and uh, have $400,000 uh, transactions, worth of transactions on their credit cards. If those numbers don't add up, that's a very useful uh, way for the CRA to spot a person who may not be compliant. You know, uh, if a lawyer gets a CRA request for a list of clients, won't that be covered by client lawyer privilege, the identities of clients? Uh, yes. Yes. So a lawyer probably will will be relieved from compliance, or they will not send one to the lawyer, probably, right? Uh, yes, but then again, it depends uh, on the type of information they would be seeking. Generally, yes, that would be um, subject to um, solicitor client privilege. But um, you know, I, I sometimes there, there would be there could be rare circumstances where um some documents still need to be provided maybe redacted so that certain information is uh, not available to the cra uh but generally in most cases lawyers should not be subjected to these orders i see well on this note unless mm -hmm. uh, there is something that you want to add I want to thank you for this fascinating conversation. I learned a lot. I hope our audience did too. Thank you very much for your time. I know that you're a busy tax lawyer and you probably are going to get busier yet this year. Thank you so much, Anna. I really appreciate uh, your time today. Thank you for having me. Bye.